Hi, and welcome to lesson three in our phases of matter unit. Here we're gonna look at the energy that's required for a particular phase changes. In our first couple of lessons for this unit, we've learned about how to describe the phases of matter and how to identify them on heating and cooling curves. In this lesson, we're gonna take a look at quantifying the amount of energy necessary to do things like melt ice into water. I know it sounds really, really dynamic, but it is important, and so we have to have a discussion about it. Let's take a moment and think about melting and boiling. My questions to you are, what's happening to the particles during each of these changes? Are the particles getting into more energetic configurations or less energetic configurations? Take a moment, write down your answer, and then answer this question. Are these processes endothermic or exothermic? Do we have to put energy in to get this to happen, or do we have to remove energy to get it to happen? Pause the video and write down your answers, and once you have them, let's move on. Now think about the opposite processes. Think about the process of condensing and freezing a substance. And again, the same questions. What happens to the particles of this substance during each of these phase changes? And are these processes endothermic or exothermic? And how do we know? Again, take a moment and write down your answers. And when you're ready, let's move on. Let's go back to a heating curve and see if we can understand what's happening in and between the different phases as we heat a substance in terms of the energy that we're putting in. The first point that I'll remind you of is that a change in temperature equates to a change in the average kinetic energy for a substance. So on this heating curve, if we are putting in energy and the temperature is going up, the kinetic energy also has to be increasing. So in each of these three intervals where the substance temperature is rising as we put in energy, we know that the kinetic energy is increasing. The potential energy is remaining the same because our particles in a particular phase are already arranged in a particular energetic conformation. But if you consider the energetics involved in the two phase changes shown on this diagram, you can see that at these places, our kinetic energy is remaining the same. And we know this because the temperature isn't changing, but we're still investing energy. That energy has to go into increasing the particles overall potential energy. Think back to the way that the particles are arranged in the different phases. It's going to require an investment of energy during each phase change in order to change those arrangements and affect the potential energy of those particles. On a cooling curve, it's going to look very, very similar, but of course our temperature will be going down in a particular phase, and so that's going to cause the kinetic energy to go down. And during a particular phase change, we'll be removing energy from the arrangement of our particles, so we'll be decreasing the potential energy. Now that we have an understanding of that, let's go in and take a look at the actual math involved in these two phase changes. The first thing that we need to understand is that every substance has a characteristic amount of energy that you need to put into or take out of it in order to make it go through a particular phase change. These are going to be expressed as some amount of energy in joules per gram of a particular substance. The first one that we're going to see here is what's called heat of fusion or HF for a particular substance. Fusion refers to melting. And so the heat of fusion is the amount of energy necessary to melt or freeze one gram of a substance at that substance's melting point. Heat of fusion for water is given to you on reference table B. We've already used reference table B when we talked about calorimetry, but here we can see that we're talking about a heat of fusion of 334 joules per gram of water in order to melt or freeze water. We can use this in order to calculate the amount of energy we'll need in order to melt a particular mass of water or the amount of energy that will be released when we freeze a particular mass of water. This equation is given to us on reference table T. It's Q equals MHF, and reference table T, of course, tells us what each of these variables stand for. Let's take this equation and try to use it to see how it works. Here's a question from page six of your unit three packet. The question is, how many joules does it take to melt 100 grams of water at its melting point? Take a moment and pause the video to see if you can solve this problem. And then when you're ready, click play and let's move through and look at the solution. So we are melting this substance. For that, we're going to need to use Q equals MHF. We know the mass of the water is 100 grams, and we know that the heat of fusion for water is 334 joules per gram. So this problem just becomes a question of plugging in our values, multiplying it out, giving us an answer of 33,400 joules of energy needed in order to melt that 100 grams of water at water's melting point. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have before we move on. When we want to boil or condense the substance, we're going to use a different constant, what's called HV, or the heat of vaporization, which is the amount of energy we need in order to boil or condense one gram of a substance at that substance's boiling point. 
HV for water is shown on reference table B. It's right below HF. It's 2260 joules per gram. Notice that it's considerably larger than HF is for water, and this will basically be true in all substances. The amount of heat we need to turn something from a liquid to a gas is going to be considerably larger than the amount of heat that we need to turn a substance from a solid to a liquid. If you're wondering why this is, my suggestion to you is to go back and look at the arrangement of the particles to see why it might not take so much energy to go from solid to a liquid, but why it takes a lot more to go from a liquid to a gas. We can use HV to calculate how much energy we're going to need to boil or condense any amount of a particular substance, as long as we know what its HV value is. For that, we're going to use the third heat equation on reference table T, which is Q equals MHV. This works almost identically to Q equals MHF, but of course we have a different constant for HV and we're using it for a different phase change. Let's try a problem with HV so that we can see how this works. This problem is on page six of your unit three packet. How many joules does it take to boil 100 grams of water at its boiling point? Pause the video and try to solve the problem. And then when you're ready, let's move on and look at the solution together. So because we're boiling the substance, we need to use Q equals MHV. Now we just plug in our values and multiply them out in order to get our answer of 226,000 joules. Thanks for watching our discussion about how to calculate the amount of energy that we use to go through particular phase changes. Make sure here at the end of the video that you can do each of the following. Make sure that you can explain what happens to the energy and the arrangement of particles during a phase change. Make sure that you can use the heat of fusion and the heat of vaporization for a particular substance in order to determine the amount of energy absorbed or released during phase changes. If you can do those two things, you're in a great place. If not, take a moment, write down any questions that you have, and you can always leave them in the comments below the video, or you can always get in touch with me through the information in the info field. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.